My name is Austin Mitchell, and I'm an addict. Now, I know what you're probably thinking after hearing that. As I'm sure, images of the most common vices, for example, drugs and alcohol, just ran through your mind. But how I wish my addiction was that simple, as I'm an addict to something far worse than any other vices you may think of. There really isn't a word for this condition, as some doctors and psychologists, that I am an extreme adrenaline junkie. But I know it isn't an adrenaline rush that I'm looking for. What I'm really addicted to is seeing death. Now, I know this must be very strange to hear, but after hearing my story, you'll understand the reason behind my strange addiction. I've been dealing with death ever since I was a little kid. When I was 10, I remember pulling dangerous stunts like pole walking on the high jungle gym during recess. I did this just to see how far I could get before I fell. My strange antics just went up a notch from there, as when I was 12, I decided to jump out of my bedroom window just for the fun of it. These bizarre activities led me to break a lot of bones, and I was rushed to the ICU more than once. My parents and siblings all thought I was insane, as they all believed something was truly wrong with my head. But I didn't blame them, as I knew they couldn't see what I was seeing. As I grew older, I craved that dangerous feeling even more, as I started to do things that were even crazier. My friends at the time called me the ultimate daredevil, and it didn't take long before they saw my strange antics as a way to make a profit, because they eventually started filming them and uploading the videos online. These videos gained traction almost immediately, and it didn't take long before they all went viral. Most nights, I would read the comments under these videos, and I would see people saying things like, I can't believe this guy is crazy enough to constantly put his life at stake just for our own amusement and to get a couple of views. I always chuckled at comments like these because I knew deep down that I didn't care about the views. I truly did all these dangerous acts for my own thrill. It happened on the 16th of July, 2010. To increase the stakes, I decided to do something I had never done before as I made arrangements to swim with sharks. This was probably the most dangerous thing I had ever done and I wasn't sure if I was going to survive or not. My friends tried to talk me out of it as they said it was far too dangerous. But I told them that they shouldn't be worried as my goal wasn't to die, but to get so close to death that I could see her. They still tried to talk me out of it, but I had my mind made up and no one was going to change it. We made our way to New Smyrna Beach in Florida, a place that was notoriously known as the shark capital of the world. Numerous safety precautions were made as there was a safety boat nearby in case anything too deadly happened. The cameras were then set up and we began to wait. I still remember standing in the water with a huge smile on my face as the thrill I felt was amazing. An hour had quickly gone by and nothing had happened yet. I thoroughly enjoyed the suspense as I knew something dangerous was going to happen at any minute now. But the hours kept passing us by and nothing exciting had still happened. I could see the tension on the faces of my friends and the safety crew as they were all expectantly waiting for something to happen. But as the day went by, the tension turned into fatigue and it started to seem like no sharks were going to show up. It didn't take long before they told me that I should give up and try again tomorrow. But I didn't want to leave, and I was determined to see this through to the very end. I already knew it wasn't going to happen quickly, as I had done a lot of research on sharks. I knew these animals weren't ones to go out of their way to attack people, as the ISAF, International Shark Attack File, reported that it was more likely to be struck by lightning than be attacked by a shark. I knew the odds weren't in my favor, but I also knew that these animals had a crazy attraction to blood. So to speed things up, I asked for a pocket knife. They gave me the knife and I proceeded to give myself a little cut on the leg while standing in the water. I told myself that this was bound to attract at least one of them and I braced myself for it, but nothing happened. It was getting pretty late now and I had been in the water for too long. The safety team kept trying to convince me to take a break before I continued, but I didn't agree. They could tell my mind was set on this, so they decided to go back to shore and get something to eat. As the safety boat pulled away, I started to get a change of heart. My skin was completely wrinkled now, and I was also pretty hungry. I was finally about to give up when it happened. I instantly felt like my leg was in a shredder as I was fighting to drag underwater. I thrashed and struggled against it, but it was too strong. The safety team, who had noticed this, immediately started to make their way back to me but they were too far to reach me in time. The pain was unbearable and I started to scream, but it didn't take long before I stopped screaming as I found myself smiling. This was it. 
This was all I craved for, all I ever wanted. It was perfect. I stopped struggling now, and I was about to give in when two strong arms pulled me out of the water. Spear guns were used to repel the shark, and they quickly rushed me to the hospital. Luckily, the shark wasn't able to take my entire leg off, but I was left with 48 stitches for the 24 cuts I had received. This incident shook my friends as we were told that I was lucky to be alive. After that, they all decided to stop the videos in the extreme daredevil stunts, as they realized that I could have actually died that day. But all I could really think about was the next life-threatening situation I was going to put myself in. I was always prepared to die, as I knew it was bound to happen sooner rather than later. I also knew that, even if they stopped filming me, I would continue doing my dangerous stunts to keep chasing that thrill. This was the only way I could come face to face with death, and I know I'll give anything to see her beautiful pale face once again. To most people, going to the beach is a form of relaxation, a place to chill, surf, and enjoy the sand and fresh air. But to me, a beach is a place I'm never going to visit again, not after my horrible experience there. This incident happened when I was in high school. I often go to parties and nightclubs. I stayed with my grandparents. I snuck out of the house daily, hardly slept at home, and my grandparents never noticed. On that particular day, my friends and I decided to have a beach party. We invited our girlfriends. I bought a lot of drinks and snacks. We were determined to party all night. We got to the beach and started partying. We played truth or dare and danced around. It wasn't long before we all became drunk and slept on the floor. An intense pain woke me up. I needed to ease myself. I stood up and staggered forward to relieve myself. It was already dark, so I took out a flashlight. I was too drunk to walk to the toilet, so I decided to walk toward the water and do my business inside there. I let out a guilty frown as I continued the disgusting and disturbing act. I was almost done with my business when I had an eerie feeling of someone watching me. I looked around and I saw a hooded figure from afar. I took out my flashlight and pointed it in the direction. I didn't get a good look, but I could see his teeth. He was chuckling evilly. My heart skipped a beat, and I had an unusual feeling. The hooded figure started walking towards me. I nervously adjusted my pants to head back and wake my friends. Immediately, I turned around to go back. The strange figure walking towards me suddenly started running. I increased my pace and quickly woke everyone up. I told them I saw someone strange and suspicious, and we needed to leave urgently. I took a stick, hoping to use it to defend myself. Where is this strange person you're talking about? Mike said. I looked back, but I didn't see anyone. But he was just behind me, I said. My girlfriend, who was still sleepy. What's wrong, Jack? Did you see a ghost? She said as she burst out laughing. Everyone joined her. That's what happens when you drink too much, Mike said while tapping my shoulder. You must have seen a tree and thought it was a person. <laughs> That's the work of vodka, Nathan said, handing me a bottle of vodka. I dismissed the thought and took my mind off what I saw. We continued partying and drinking and everything was fine. Mike staggered off with his girlfriend, one hand on her, and he had drinks in the other. Going to make out? Nathan said jokingly. We all smiled. After about 30 minutes, Jess, Mike's girlfriend, ran back covered in blood. She tried to talk, but she was out of breath. We kept asking what happened. What the hell happened? Where's Mike? Nathan asked. Jess managed to squeeze some words out. A weird dude attacked us. My eyes popped out. A weird dude. We all followed Jess to the scene. She said Mike was badly hurt. On getting there, we didn't see anyone. Must have been the strange guy I saw earlier, I said nervously. We searched the beach for a while and didn't see anything. I brought out my phone to call the police, but Nathan advised us to dispose of all the drugs. We gave Nathan all the drugs we had on us to dispose of. Nathan took it all and ran to the water to dispose of it there. My phone was still with me, and 
I was waiting on Nathan's signal to call for help, but he was taking too long. Nathan, are you done? I called out. There was no response, and I knew something was wrong. We're being hunted. Who is this creepy dude, and what does he want from us? Many thoughts crossed my mind, and I started getting scared. This is getting out of hand. Call the cops now. Cassie, Nathan's girlfriend, said in tears. I took out my phone to call for help anyway, but there was no signal. At this point, I was already scared. The girls started panicking, and Jess was crying bitterly about going home, but I couldn't leave without Nathan and Mike. I tried looking for them for a while. I took the lead, and the girls were behind me. I kept calling out to Nathan, but there was no response. Disagreement was amassed, and my heart was pounding. The only sound we could hear was the waves, and I couldn't shake off my eerie feeling. I finally decided to leave the beach and come back for help. As we were heading to my car, I heard Nathan's voice. He was shouting for help. Cassie turned around to go to Nathan, but I stopped her. I gave my girlfriend the car keys and told her to drive off and call for help. She didn't want to let me go, telling me how dangerous it was to go back, but I couldn't leave without my friends, so I persuaded her to go with Cassie and Jess. I had a stick in one hand and a flashlight in the other. I pointed the stick out nervously and ran towards Nathan's voice. I kept running until I got back to the water. I didn't hear Nathan's voice anymore, and I didn't see anyone. Coming back was a mistake. I should have gone with the girls, I thought to myself. I kept looking around. I was out of breath and petrified. I was about to leave the beach when I noticed something in the water. It looked like a floating body. I moved closer to observe more, and there was Mike's dead body. I stood there, frozen, unable to move. I fell to the ground and crawled backward. I was shocked and confused. I couldn't believe my eyes. I felt someone hovering behind me. I turned around, scared down my pants to check if someone was behind me. I hadn't gotten a chance to see the face of whoever was behind me when I got punched in the face. The punch knocked me out. I don't know how long I was out, but when I gained consciousness, I was lying on the ground very close to the edge of the water. At this point, I didn't care for anyone. I just wanted to leave the beach for good. I had no idea who was messing with us. Is Mike really dead? I thought to myself. I was determined to leave the beach at all costs. I was so scared. I tried to stand up to leave. I was feeling dizzy and weak. Tears rolled down my eyes as I was still struggling to walk away and find refuge. Suddenly, someone pulled my hair and dragged me into the water. It was a firm grip. I screamed at the top of my voice, help! I struggled a bit, but it was obvious I wasn't strong enough. Before I could blink, I could feel the salty taste of the beach water all over my throat. I stood up immediately. I got a good look at the person. His terrible teeth and the evil smile on his face made me realize he was the same person I saw hovering around me earlier. I knew I didn't have a chance. He was bigger and stronger than I was, so I started begging for my life. My plead must have provoked him as he got angry and punched me in the face. I fell into the water, and he kept his hands over my head, preventing me from getting out. He seemed to be having fun. I was too weak to struggle or fight. That moment was the most terrifying moment of my life. I thought that was the end. I was at the brim of death, yet he didn't bother to pull my head out. I tried struggling a bit, but it didn't make much difference. I had lost all hope, and I suddenly couldn't feel or hear anything until it was lights out. Thankfully, it wasn't long before Jess and the girls came with the cops. I was rescued right on time, and after performing CPR, I started breathing again, and I was taken to the hospital. Nathan was also rescued unconscious. He only suffered a head injury. The doctor said he was hit multiple times on the head. Unfortunately, Mike wasn't so lucky. 
The weird guy was finally captured after two weeks of intense investigation. The profiler for our case had suggested that the killer was someone who had a grudge against us all, or at least one of us, because his attacks seemed personal. Still, when he was captured, none of us had seen him before. He was just a psychopath who goes about killing young people at the beach, and he's been on the police's wanted list for years. The thought of someone just attacking random people at the beach still shocks me. My grandparents tried their best for me to live a normal life after that, but I couldn't. The event still haunts me to this day. My name is Nadia, and I am 27 years old. I have two university degrees and I'm doing well in my job. I'm working all year round, so when vacations come I immediately go to the mountains to rest. My friends sometimes tell me to go to the beach, but I tell them that the sand and the sun are not my things. None of this is true, but I never dared tell them what was really going on. Every time I think of the beach, horrible images invade my thoughts. Memories of a terrifying night when, just because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, I almost didn't survive to remember it. I was only 13 years old, and on vacation with my father. He and my mom were separated, so I had to divide my time to be with both of them. I had just come from a mini vacation with my mom, and now I had to spend a few days at my dad's beach house. The first few days went by fast. I was distracted by meeting people and going out to eat in the evenings, so the vacation was going by fast. Everything changed one Tuesday night. That day was usually the day that the beaches were less visited. I was returning from an evening dinner with my father, and we decided to walk along the beach. This was usually not recommended, as the beach can be very unsafe in the dark. But my father, who had been coming to this house since his childhood, assured me that nothing would happen to us. The night was coming along well. The darkness did not scare me, and seeing the beach in the dark and silence was a new experience that made me feel very good. I got a little ahead of my dad and ran along the beach until some lights caught my attention. There were a bunch of men in white robes in front of me. Some of them were holding candle lanterns, while others were together carrying a large bundle. It didn't take me more than a few seconds to realize what was inside that bundle. It was a human body. I couldn't see the human form, but the size was that of an adult, and I could see the blood dripping from the black bag. My first reaction was to run crying, but before I could do anything, my father was already looking at the same scene as me, except that he was not hiding. As soon as he saw the image, Fear took hold of my father. He gave a muffled scream and ran away without looking in my direction. The hooded men turned around and saw him. Some came closer to where I was, still without seeing me. But as soon as they could see my father's back, they seemed to be satisfied, so they went back to where they were and continued on their way. Although I was scared too, I managed to keep my composure and stay calm enough to slip away without making any noise. When I arrived at the beach house, he was already packing all his things in desperation, immediately asking me to do the same. I went to my room to put all of my stuff away. Luckily, I brought very little luggage, so I was done pretty quickly. I heard a strange noise coming from outside, so I left my bags under the bed and peeked out the window. On the other side, shadows moved quickly and stealthily behind my house. Suddenly, I felt a loud knock at the entrance of our house, and I could barely react as a bunch of footsteps invaded our vacation home. As soon as I heard the noises, I ducked under my bed, with a knife to protect myself, 
and put the suitcase in front of me so they wouldn't see me. Behind it, I could see how a pile of boots covered with the same white tunic I had seen on the beach surrounded the house. Some of them came into my room, but left without much interest when they saw it empty. I kept taking deep breaths and praying that my father might escape, but as if in response, I heard his screams coming from his room, and within seconds, noises of him being dragged through the house. The men in white dragged him into the dining room, and for the first time, I could see him from under the bed. One of them approached him and told him he had interrupted a sacrifice that they were making to appease the wrath of the sea, which was adamant about offerings. My father tearfully asked for forgiveness, but none of these people were the least bit interested in listening to him. While some of them held him by his arms and legs on the dining room floor, the one who spoke approached him with a knife and drew some symbols on his belly with a pen. They were symbols I had never seen before, but that was the least of our worries. The man threw the pen to the side of the house, and another one of the hooded men carefully picked it up and put it away. The man who was talking and drawing was clearly the leader. The leader then began to rub the knife across the patterns on my father's body, marking him while ignoring his screams. Suddenly, he tightened his grip on the knife and cut open his stomach. He was still alive, so in complete panic. I could see not only the knife being plunged into him, but all his guts being pulled out and stuffed into black bags. His screams of pain choked as he lost consciousness. These men did not care whether he was alive or not. They simply removed his organs with precision, very violently and quickly, but with surgical precision. You could tell that they had already done it several times and had practice, not to mention that they were completely desensitized to human life. After they finished, they simply gathered up all their bags and left, while others stayed behind to clean up any traces of blood or anything that might incapacitate them. After several minutes, the last men were leaving. I didn't know how to react. I had witnessed everything that had happened to my father, and somehow, they hadn't detected me. The men had already left, so I threw the suitcase and prepared to leave. But the footsteps continued, and a man came rushing into my room after hearing the noise I made. By the time he came in, I had already hidden again, but he knew something was wrong. This person ran my suitcase and saw me. He tried to reach for me with his hands as I went backwards, and after a few seconds, he managed to grab my leg. When he pulled me back, I used the knife I kept with me, and with my eyes closed, I stabbed him in the eyes. Instead of running, I pressed the knife into his face and made sure it went in as far as possible. When I was sure he was dead, I ran out of the house with my cell phone and called my mom, who thought everything I told her was a lie. After coming to look for me and calling the police, they found no trace of my father, but they knew who the culprits were. As their leader had said, the murderers were part of a clan that was dedicated to making sacrifices for the sea. They could never find them, as they always perform their rituals at a random place and time. After that, I went back to my mother and decided to never go to the beach again, even if I went to one far away. I would feel that those people would be there, looking for me to finish their work. Hi, my name's John. I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. My entire life, all I knew was traffic, skyscrapers, and snowy winters. By the time I finished high school, I was ready for a change. I decided to take a year to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. A year to see and experience something different. Turned out, a summer was all I needed. After my graduation, I packed my belongings and moved to the most different place I could imagine. 
If snow and traffic was all I ever knew, maybe sand and ocean waves would be an appropriate change. I moved to a secluded beach town in the outskirts of Honolulu. My childhood years swimming at the YMCA paid off when I was able to land a job as a lifeguard. Most summer visitors looking for work preferred the busier and more lucrative beaches of Honolulu, always bustling with rich tourists and extravagant lifestyles. That's not what I wanted. I wanted to be off the map, and that's what I found myself in my little corner of Hawaii. Most of my days were spent sitting on a high lifeguard chair, reading a book, and keeping an eye for any distress the waves might cause. I quickly made acquaintances of most of the residents of the beach. It was a close-knit community, and everyone hurried to meet the new outsider from Chicago, me. By the second week, I was welcomed as one of their own, and the novelty of my arrival had passed. One evening, as the beach became deserted, I came down from my high chair, ready to call it a day, when I noticed something, rather someone, by the seashore. As I approached, I began to make out what looked like a man, crouched down, picking something off the ground. His back was turned to me, and his grunt and murmurs elevated above the drowning sound of waves crashing down. Uh, hello? I questioned. The man, still crouched, turned to face me. What stared at me looked more like a troll than a human. His face was lacerated in different places. His hair was long but patchy. His eyes bulged from its sockets, on a face with thin, tight, translucent skin. He wore a long coat full of holes and patches, similarly torn patches and thick military boots. The contrast of his attire with the relaxing beach setting might have been comical if it weren't for one thing. His mouth dripped blood and small pieces of flesh. In his hand, a long fish gasped for air and squirmed around his tight grip. Blood streamed from a mouth-sized hole on the fish's back. Next to the man was a pile of fish carcasses. The man began to rise, but by then, I was sprinting away from the moonlit oceanside. I heard nonsensical grunts, but they quickly faded as I distanced myself. The troll man wasn't spotted for the next few weeks. Around town, I asked vague questions about a mysterious man that may live on the beach, omitting the flesh-eating details in an attempt to not sound crazy to my new friends. Nobody seemed familiar with this mystery man, and I didn't press any further. As time passed, I began feeling guilty for my harsh judgment of this man. Perhaps he was a homeless man, hungry, and resorting to raw fish for survival. After all, I like sushi. And here I was, thinking of him as a troll. One evening, I exited the beach, leaving the sand under my feet for the pavement when a noise caused me to look back. Against the tapestry that was the roaring ocean and starry night sky, I saw the silhouette of a man, wild hair up in the air, creepy along the shore. A short distance ahead of him, a colony of seagulls congregated around food remains. It had to be the homeless man, I thought. I made my way back in his direction quietly. As I approached, his creep towards the gulls accelerated. Before long, he was in a full-out sprint towards them. A few gulls took flight at the approaching threat. The majority stayed, indulging in their dinner. I raised a hand about to greet the sprinting man when he launched himself towards the remaining gulls. His body, parallel to the ground, landed in the center of the group, causing the remaining stragglers to clear out. The loud thud emitted on the soft sand was concerning. Are you okay? I called out. Oblivious to me, the man seemed occupied with something. Horror filled me as I approached and visibility improved. The man wrestled with an enormous seagull that squawked in panic. He held it under the weight of his body as feathers rose through flapping wings seeking escape. By then, a few other gulls had floated above the man, pecking him, attempting to aid their captive brethren. The man grunted and yelped, swatting away the flying gulls and brought down his head. He sunk his teeth to the neck of the captive seagull. The flapping of wings slowed, replaced by a steady flow of blood shooting from the bird's neck. The wings dropped down, void of his life, and the man sunk his teeth down again, this time ripping a large chunk of flesh. The crunching of bone crackled over the crashing waves. He lowered his head and directed the stream of blood into his mouth. His face turned to my direction, 
continuing to suck wildly on the bird's neck. Need something bigger. More blood, he whispered roughly, blood dripping from his mouth. With similar vigor at his sprint towards the gulls, he began charging in my direction. I ran and ran and ran. Sand lifted wildly behind me with every stride I took, obscuring the sight of the bloody man chasing me. The sand under my feet was replaced by pavement soon, and I continued to run. I don't know when he stopped following me, but I took no chances. That night, I packed my things, called my boss, and gave him my resignation. That morning, I was on a flight back to Chicago. A few weeks and one horrible experience was enough for me to want to return home. I had all of the beach I needed for a lifetime.